7 o'clock. We can turn to Psalm 1. That's where I wanted to start. Psalm 1. <clears throat> we don't normally... I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, when I was uh, growing up, I always heard Nehemiah taught in a very similar way, that it was this book kind of on leadership, and, and you see how he is taking such good leadership, and he is a good leader. So I think it's a good thing to draw out of the book. Um, but sometimes when I read, I don't know if this is true of you, that's like all that goes into my mind. I think I, I heard it preached so, uh, several times, and so that's what I think of, is like Nehemiah is a, a leadership manual or something. Uh, and I, th- I think obviously it's more than that. It's a story of what God is doing, but I also think it's a story of someone who loves the Scriptures and knows the Scriptures and, and really uh, fears God wants to obey the scriptures and, and do the right thing. And um, it feels like we don't get to see that heart uh, in the scriptures too often, you know, uh, where he just really just doesn't care what other people think. He doesn't care about the political moves he should make or uh, how the other people who are in similar positions to him, how they're using those positions to get money. He just doesn't really care about uh, any of those things for himself. He just wants to fear the Lord and do what's right, and love God's people, and love God's glory. It reminds me of Psalm 1. Uh, if you look at Psalm 1, uh, blessed, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." As I was reading that psalm, it just struck me, that's Nehemiah. You know, he's, he's living his life in front of God's eyes, knowing that the Lord sees, uh, knowing that the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And he just, he just seems to only care about it. And we're going to see it several more times today. That's why I'm bringing it up. Um, he seems to only care about what the Lord thinks. And, and the way he's going to know what the Lord wants him to do is he seems to have really meditated on the law. Um, so let me pray, and then after I pray, we'll, we'll turn actually to Deuteronomy for just a moment before we go over to Nehemiah. So let me pray. Father, we pray that as we see um, this example from a man who uh, just seems like his impulse is to fear you, to constantly rely on you in prayer, uh, to constantly care about what's right in your eyes and, and what your law says. Uh, we pray that you would make us like that, that you would make us men and women of integrity, that genuinely from the heart uh, long to do what's right in your eyes. We pray that you would give us a, a healthy fear of you, that we'd love to obey, that we remember that you hear our prayers, that we remember that you see those that oppose uh, your people. So help us trust you as, as Nehemiah did. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, turn over to Deuteronomy 24. Uh, Deuteronomy, I, I can't remember what context, I've said this about three times recently, and I can't remember what context, it might have been Sunday school, but Deuteronomy is this uh, repeating of the law, uh, summarizing the law, explaining God's word to God's people right before they enter the land. So these are Moses' last words that he really wants the people to hear. And um, if you look at the headings in chapter 24, uh, mine, the ESV says laws concerning divorce, but then it says miscellaneous laws. And that's really kind of the uh, feel of this chunk. You know, it's, he's going from law to law. 
But um, look at verse 5, for example. We love this one. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. It's a, just a happy, it's a, a happy verse, a happy law. Um, but if you're thinking about law again, uh, that was a law. That was part of their nation, right? Uh, this is not just... Uh, statements of what God would want them to do. This is what they are to adjudicate their cases and assign penalties to if people are breaking these laws. Uh, and if you're thinking about a law like that in society, again, you, you know you're going to have guys that are a little bit of a scoundrel that try and uh, bend that law to what they want to do. Maybe they know a military conflict is coming and they like this girl, uh, but um, they're going to wait. And the girl's like, come on, you know, it's been three years. I thought he was going to ask me to marry him, but he's waiting because he's a scoundrel. And, and once a battle breaks out, oh, it's time to get married, you know, so that we don't have, so that I don't have to go to battle. You know, you know you're going to have people like that in a society, and yet still this is the law that they're to live by. And besides just live by, uh, this is the law that they're to meditate on because it's teaching you about the Lord. It teaches you what he wants. And we saw that in Psalm 1, and you see that over and over in the Psalms and elsewhere, is that, that the, the law is something to be meditated on so you can know what God wants you to do. And so as we keep reading some of these laws, look at verse 6. No one shall take a mill or an upper millstone and pledge, for that would be taking a life and pledge. So what's a mill used for? Right, grinding, grinding what you need to eat, right? Um, uh, grinding, I guess, wheat to make flour, right? And it's, so he mentions both parts. You can't take the bottom part, the mill, and you can't take the top part, the upper millstone. Um, because if you're doing that, then you're taking their livelihood. You're taking their life, so don't, don't take that. Uh, verse 7, If a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel... And if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Look at, down at verse 10. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge. You shall stand outside. And the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he's a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it shall be righteousness for you, for you before the Lord your God. Such a clear statement, right? And here, by the end, you can tell that the pledge in this case was a cloak. But you can tell they're, they're supposed to, as the people of God, have this decency towards one another. Um, if, if you're taking this cloak and that's going to injure this man's life, uh, that night, well, give it back to him for the night, and then he can take it again and hold it in pledge in the morning. Uh, don't treat each other so wrongly. Even if you are, if, even if there are going to be these debts uh, or pledges, um, you're not to be charging interest on those debts. You're not to be taking things that are their livelihood. Look down at verse 14. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether he is one of uh, one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your town. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. So you can see again, this, this is just common decency. This is the way they're supposed to treat each other as parts, part of the same community. And you see a positive statement uh, at the end of verse 13. It shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. You know, the Lord will see that you do this loving thing, that you return the cloak for the night, uh, even though by the world standards you didn't have to do that because you've taken it in pledge. Um, at the end of 15, you see a negative statement, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. So the person who's reading this and meditating on the law, yes, this is going to be used in a court of law if, if someone is offending in this way, but as someone's meditating, they're also learning the Lord doesn't smile on that kind of thievery and that kind of putting others' lives in danger. He doesn't like it when we 
take each other into slavery. He doesn't like any of those things. Uh, and he sees all of it. Um, verse 17. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or the fatherless, or take a widow's garment and pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. We could go on, um, but you can turn over to Nehemiah chapter 5. What we see in Nehemiah is somebody who just seems to get this in the core of his heart, that he just gets that he needs to fear the Lord, the Lord sees, and he needs to love the people of God. Um, it's clear that those around him that are in similar positions have the total opposite persuasion. We're going to see it several times tonight. They're, they are um, they're doing the opposite. They're disobeying th these laws, and if not a direct disobedience to the law, they're at least disobeying the heart of the law uh, and sometimes directly disobeying the law. So look at chapter 5, verse 1. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. Okay, so something should alarm you with that, right? There's, there's the people, and they're all busy with this project. Remember, if, if you haven't been with us, um, Nehemiah has come back, and the main reason is because they've been in the land for a whole generation. They've had the temple. This is after they've returned from exile, but there's a shameful state of the city because no one lives there, and there's no walls, and so all the enemies around, uh, they ridicule. They, they think the Jews are just mere feeble Jews who can't do anything, and so God is being dishonored. So this really captivates Nehemiah. He wants to go back and do the right thing. So they're doing this project together, but then a great outcry of the people and other wives against their Jewish brothers comes up. And the reason, look at verse 2. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. Okay, so that's problem number one. Um, how that involves the Jewish brothers, we're not sure. But there, there's, some, there's these big families, they have a lot of children, and uh, there's either been a famine, there has been a famine, they'll say in a minute, but there's a shortage of food, and these families aren't being able to feed their families, maybe because they're working on the wall, or just they wouldn't have been able to anyways. And so there's an outcry against Jewish brothers who would have a way to remedy this. We'll look at verse 3. It's not all they're doing. There were also those who said... We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. Um, this is what they had to do back in Egypt, what the Egyptians had to do when Joseph was there. Um, this is not something that the people of Israel should demand of each other. Uh, so you get the picture that a poor family was coming to someone who had the wealth or had the food that could bless them. Uh, but they demanded that they gave them the money. And so these families are having to mortgage their you know, take out a loan on their own land um, and have it, that word is like, use it as principle, basically. Mortga I think mortgage is a great translation. So um, take, it, take out a loan so that they can pay these people just so they can eat. Well, what does that mean those people are? That means that they are Jewish men who are seizing the lands of these people and, and making them pay back. And I think you could maybe do that in a friendly way. Maybe say, hey, you know, why don't we just say, we have a mortgage, I won't charge you interest, uh, we'll wait till better days, and until then, don't worry about it. You know, I think there, it might have started like a good way like that, um, but now it's gotten oppressive. They don't have food, and now they don't have the vineyards uh, to provide the things that they need, uh, and it gets worse. Look at verse 4. And there were those who said, <coughs> we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. So uh, the debt is mounting up because they had to have the money to buy the food, so they're mortgaging their lands. But then now, on top of that, they still have to pay the tax that was due. Um, and if I remember right, those were usually property taxes or like uh, taxes on the goods that they would have. Um, and they, they weren't able to pay those taxes. And so now they're even having to sell. Um, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards, verse 5. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. 
but it is not in our power to help it, for, the, for other men have our fields and our vineyard. You could just see this spiral of, of how bad it got. They've mortgaged their fields and vineyards, so they can't remedy this situation, but tax was due, and it was demanded they had to pay this tax. So then their only option was they were selling their own children into slavery to their Jewish brothers. Um, it's, it's getting bad, right? And you can quickly see how there are certain of these Jewish men that are really enriching themselves, taking advantage of this, these tough times. Um, and you can imagine this just would drive someone like Nehemiah crazy, uh, who comes back and cares so much about God's people and cares so much about the Lord and his law. Um, it drives them crazy. So look at verse 6. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. So I took counsel with myself. It's always a good step that we skip when we're very angry. Uh, I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we have able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations but you even sell your brothers that may be, they may be sorry, you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. And they were silent and could not find a word to say. So now we're just getting the whole full picture. You know, it, Nehemiah seems to, out of the treasury or something, or out of the funds he's been given, trying to buy Jews out of slavery to get them back in the land. And what he finds out is as this is happening, he has Jewish men that are selling more Jews back into slavery. And so as Nehemiah is working to get them in, they're over here just pumping them back out into slavery and hoping that they'll be able to get bought back. And you can just see how furious this would make Nehemiah of at the end of the day, maybe this, this daughter or this son gets to go back to their parents' house, but now we've had to pay this person and they paid this person instead of just saying, let's forget all that. Um, let's just be decent to one another. Let's care about one another. Any thoughts? Any questions so far? Yeah, Paul. Right. 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 Yep. I agree. And, and you can imagine if that law is so clear and they're disobeying that, that they're going to be disobeying all the others like it. You know, the sabbatical year where you return all the slaves, uh, probably not happening, right? If they're going to be able to profit off of, off of the children. And, or uh, we don't know if they're necessarily children. But Okay, um, verse... Nine. So, so uh, Nehemiah calls this assembly. He charges them. He says, you're, you're breaking these laws. You're, this is ridiculous. We're working to get all the people back, and you're working against us, and you're just doing this to profit. So verse, th they were silent, could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us ab abandon this exacting of interest. You know, we're, we're trying to, Nehemiah's concern is blessing the people, lending them what they need. Uh, stop this exacting of interest. Stop enriching yourselves against the law. And, and look at what he says again in verse 9. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? You just see, like, how is this not a conviction for them, like it is for Nehemiah? You know, this should, for anybody who loves God's people and, and cares about the law, isn't this obvious that we ought to be walking in the fear of the law, you know, fear of the Lord, uh, obeying the law? And and now we're we're able to be ridiculed by the enemies because they're getting to profit from this game of half the people are having to sell. Jews into slavery, and then the other people are buying them right back. You know, this is great. Uh, we're going to make a quick buck. Um, it's ridiculous. 
verse 11, return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchard, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. That's a surprise, right? <laughs> That's a great statement. Uh, and I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. So, so Nehemiah, I'm sure, is happy with a good answer, but he's going to trust and verify. He's going to make them swear with the priests. So verse 13, uh, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen. And they praised the Lord and the people did as they had promised. So they really follow his lead. They seem to get convicted. They cancel all these debts. Uh, they stop exacting the interest and at least they swear to do this. And um, they commit to it with a priest, and then Nehemiah does a sign. I don't know what that would, I don't know if he's like popping a towel or, or what that looks like. He's just shaking his garment on his leg, but whatever it is, it sounds terrifying, right, to be shaken out and emptied by the Lord. Um, any, any thoughts, any applications or things you notice? Yeah, Paul. Yeah. Right. I think I think if you piece it together what Nehemiah is saying, to me the, the best way to make sense of it is you have a destitute parent. They need to pay these taxes or they're going to be killed. So their only option is to sell their children and they're selling them to a Jewish brother. And they are selling, the Jewish brothers are selling them to the nations and Nehemiah is buying them back from uh, from those people. You could just imagine the Gentiles giggling about that. You know, how, how foolish. You know, take it, sure, we'll just funnel that through and take a cut, you know. What kind of nation does that to their own people? All right, verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah... From the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land and all my servants were gathered there for my work, for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews, and officials, beside those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand a food allowance of the governor because his service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people." We've seen a statement like that before in Nehemiah, and we're going to see it several times. Of he's, he's slipping into these prayers almost as he, as he writes this account, and that he's, he's making it clear he's doing all this in front of the Lord. He wants the Lord to remember this, um, that the other governors before him that were receiving this stipend from Persia or, or however it worked, they were using that all for themselves and then exacting things from the people. Uh, Nehemiah wasn't even spending his allowance on himself. So he wasn't exacting from the people, but he could have at least just spent the allowance on himself. And I think probably most uh, people around it wouldn't have thought that was, they would have thought that was kind, that he's not exacting more on top of that. But he wouldn't even do that. He's using his allowance to feed the needy. Uh, at my table, 150 men. So he's feeding, he's using his allowance to bless others uh, at his own expense um, and persevering on the work of the wall. Um, he's saying even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. That's the end of 15. You just see that? Such a strong statement. 
This is totally what motivates him. Um, look at 16. This is, I think this is the point in 16. Uh, he says, I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. I think he's saying the same kind of thing there. He could be using his allowance to be building an estate to gather land for the royal uh, entourage or for his family, building a name for himself. He could have been using his servants to bless him, to wait on him hand and foot, but instead, he, he asked all his servants to go and build the wall. So you can just see the point he's making. It's, it's, he's receiving this allowance. He's received servants. He's received men. And he is passing all that back through. He's not greedy about any of it. He's, he's feeding others, using what could called be right, rightfully his. He's using that to bless those around him, get the work done on this wall. Does that make sense? It's, it's uh, I think, astounding righteousness. Uh, something that, um, you know, e- even the Apostle Paul, for example, you know, when he says things like that, that he could have taken a wage, but he didn't. Or he could have taken a wife like the other apostles, but he didn't. Um, those are paraphrases, but not exact quotes. But you have that kind of attitude um, in him that he's, he's going above and beyond because he wants to bless and because he wants to serve the Lord and he wants to... Um, have a boast before the Lord, not an arrogant boast, but he wants to be able to say that he worked at this. You see that same kind of attitude in Nehemiah. He's, he's not even taking what's rightfully his. He's blessing those around him. Any other thoughts on that, on chapter 5? Paul? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. And yeah, just don't forget, Ezra's still here. He hasn't been mentioned in a long He's kind of behind the scenes. Um, but to their credit, like we said, they, they have, Nehemiah says this, and they say, we'll do as you say. And when Ezra goes and, and confronts them about uh, marrying the foreign wives, they, they weep with them, and they, they try and remedy the situation. So that is to their credit, but it, it is like over and over in such a short time, they just whiplash right back to not caring about the law and not obeying, and it's going to happen again. Nehemiah is going to leave for just a little while, uh, and then he's going to have to come back and just go to town on take care of business, I don't know, whatever you call Nehemiah, you'll see in the, at the end of the book, um, but he's tough on them. Any other thoughts, sir? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to turn that right back to you all. You know, he's, he's so motivated by the fear of God. How does that motivate us uh, as we live? How do we have that same attitude? Right. 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 He, remembering he sees it all. And, and honestly, you know, I think that's a big part of what true biblical faith is. It's trusting. He said he sees. And he said these things please him. And there's going to be a lot of times when you're doing those things in the secret. When you're doing things that you know please your father. And no one else sees. And it's hard. And no one else sees how hard it is. Uh, but you can take comfort from that faith, from that fear of the Lord, knowing, well, the Lord sees. I know he sees, and I still want to walk in righteousness. Uh, I still want to obey. Well, uh, Sam Ballot comes back, and Tobiah. So look at verse 6. Now when Sam Ballot and Tobiah, no, chapter 6, verse 1, is what I meant to say. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now when Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshub the Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it. 
although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together at Hakafirim in the, in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way. And I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sam Ballot, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And in it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in, in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. So you can just see all this. They're, they're sending letter, 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 trying to intimidate him. And, and this one really ratchets it up. You know, um, This is the kind of argument that really got the Jews in Jesus' day, right? Uh, as they were so fearful. This is why they killed Jesus, at least one of their reasons was um, they didn't want to be viewed as seditionists, right? They didn't want the Romans to think that a king had come or, or something like that. So they're trying to, to put on that kind of political pressure of, hey, we hear people saying that you're trying to become king and you're going to form this rebellion and the whole kingdom knows it, so you need to come and take counsel with us. Uh, verse 8. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you, ha- as you say have been done, for you in- are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, the word, O oh God, there, uh, the words, O oh God, are, are not actually there, but it, the translators are trying to get you to see. Um, he switches back to that second person, that voice that he's been talking, you know, and he will again. In 14, for example, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, uh, and he's already said something to the Lord, uh, remember this for my good. So uh, they add, oh God, there to help us see that that's what he's doing. But that, he ends again with a prayer. So he's, he's not falling for it. He's not going to fall for their trick. He's not going to stop in the work. Um, he knows they're just making this up. And so he, he prays to, for continued strength from the Lord. Verse 10. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehatabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live, I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophet, prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So just another plot, same ballot, and Tobiah, they, they hire this person. They say, you know, come, you know, basically claim sanctuary. That's where we get that term from, is this kind of idea. Run into the temple. People are coming to kill you. And really what they're trying to do is make him look like a coward, uh, make him sin by just running into the temple when he, he wasn't uh, clean or maybe or um, shouldn't have run into the temple. He knows it would have been a sin. Uh, and so thankfully, he, he recognizes this. I think it's because he's somebody who has meditated on the law. He, he recognizes this as something bad and, and just doesn't want to do it right away. Uh, knows that a prophet wouldn't say that kind of thing because he knows it's not okay. Any other thoughts on that section? Yeah. Yeah, I think the first one, Shemaiah, is the guy who said it. I think Noadiah must have been some other. I think she's a lady. The prophetess, yeah. She, something similar, yeah. She did something similar. 
there's more than one prophet. The rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. I don't know. This guy's sharp. He, you know, he, he really, not, I'm not trying to make it sound like he's some genius or something, but he, you could just tell he cared so much about the scriptures that he could tell when someone's trying to fool him and do something that's against the scriptures. He, he cares more about honoring God than about protecting his own life. <clears throat> All right, we'll re- read a little bit further. Look at uh, 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in, the fi- uh, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, <clears throat> all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished uh, because of a gifted leader. That's not what it says in the text, right? It says, uh, they perceived that the wor- this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. That's what the people can tell, right? Uh, Verse 17, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. Well, actually, we're not going to read that part yet. That's something different. Let's celebrate finishing the wall. So it's not just that they finished the walls and the gates, and now the city is defensible, and we'll see uh, in chapter 7, now the city is uh, inhabitable, habitable, inhabitable. One of those, uh, people can live there. Um, So that's something to celebrate, but also... Nehemiah was right. Um, Nehemiah was right. Whenever he first heard this report, all the way back in Nehemiah chapter 1, and he just gets devastated that there's no walls and the city's in disgrace, he was right. And when they get there, the people are just making fun of the Jews. They think it's impossible for them to build this wall. They're feeble Jews. Now, all of a sudden, that is just turned on its head. Uh, All these nations that were taunting them, taunting the people of God, and, you know, taunting uh, their God, right? Uh, the God of Israel, uh, that's all turned on its head because, again, verse 16, when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So, you know, again, it's not that amazing of a wall, right? It's just the community gets together, piles up this wall. It was out of the ruins that were already there. So you don't get the picture that they're, they're fearful that now Jerusalem's become this military powerhouse and they're going to take over the whole region. It's that they understand that the hand of the Lord is in this and that the God of Israel is a real God um, and that it was only with his help that this was done. They're amazed because they did this with the help of their God. Okay, now look at verse 17. Uh, one more sad part. Uh, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. And his son, Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Okay, so at the end of this, he kind of reveals this insider situation that was going on of uh, probably the same kind of uh, nobles and officials that were exacting interest from the people and making life miserable for them. Um, You'd guess it's the same crowd, but this crowd had become friendly with Tobiah, and Tobiah's kind of infiltrated a little bit. There's some marriages that have connected him to the Jewish people, and they seem to have a financial interest, so they're sending these letters back and forth, and, and they're talking about uh, Tobiah to Nehemiah in a positive way. That's what he says. Uh, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, so they're trying to get Nehemiah to like Tobiah also, um, <clears throat> and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So part of this, it was an inside job, right? Even the people of Judah, they were friendly with Tobiah while Sambala and Tobiah were actively opposing the people of God and Nehemiah was arguing against them. Well, I know that was a lot of parts of the story that we just went through, uh, but I think you just can really see what, what connects so much of this is that uh, Nehemiah has this view of Psalm 1 that the Lord does see when we meditate on his law Uh, that the one who does live this way is like this tree that's planted. He's firm. He's not constantly fearful of when someone shouts and 
uh, comes and says, get into the temple, they're trying to kill you. You know, Nehemiah still is firm, like a tree planted by a stream of water. You know, he's trusting the Lord. Um, he's walking before the Lord's eyes. He knows the law. He's meditated on it. He knows that if so many laws about that were in, in the law, that that doesn't line up with God's character to be mistreating the Jewish people like this, um, especially as a Jew, uh, mistreating your own brothers like this. And you just see him over and over in each of these little mini episodes that we just read through, uh, continuing to choose righteousness, continuing to follow the Lord. Any um, applicational thoughts? I think we, we certainly need to live like this. You know, we need to have our, as we go out and do business at a store or uh, in real estate deals or in, you know, whatever business we're in, uh, selling things, making things, making softwares, um, whatever business we're in, we need to have this kind of decency of saying, even in all these ordinary things, uh, this kind of righteousness, not just decency, but this kind of righteousness, and all these ordinary things, even in these things, the Lord sees. And he's shown in his law, even though we're not under the law, he's shown in his law that he really cares about these things. And he wants us to love people. Um, I wanted to close, unless someone was going to chime, chime in. I wanted to close with the end of Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> just because to me it sounds so much like Nehemiah. Uh, the last chapter of Second Thessalonians. Chapter 3. Uh, first, you have Paul taking flack like Nehemiah did in, in the first few verses. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing that you are doing and will do the things that we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So you see that same kind of spirit that Nehemiah had of, yes, there are wicked men. They don't trust the Lord. They don't have faith. Um, pray for us that we're delivered from them, uh, but we trust the Lord about you. We have confidence. Uh, you know, he's not too worried about it, even though he is adamantly against those wicked men. Look at verse 6. He says, uh, Now we command you, brothers... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So again, you, you have that same kind of attitude that Nehemiah had of, you know, we, we could have ha taken this right. We could have asked to be paid, uh, but we wanted to set an example of what it looks like to work hard and serve the Lord and uh, be pleasing to Him. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And remember, in the Thessalonian church, they seem to have a guy, at least one guy, who's not doing this. They're, they're um, people who are being lazy, refusing to work, relying on the kindness of the church. Uh, for we hear that some among you are, are some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, <coughs> but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. For if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So I <clears throat> just wanted to read that because, to, again, to me, that sounded so much like Nehemiah. Uh, live this righteous life. Be hardworking at this. And uh, you don't have to demand your rights. You can go above and beyond to love people and bless people. Uh, you don't need to be out for all your own uh, advancement. Uh, you can love people and bless people. You can work hard for the Lord's glory, and he sees and he knows, so don't grow weary of this. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? It's a good example for us, right? Let's pray. Father, uh, we pray that you'd help us be like this. 
um, be like Nehemiah, who so clearly feared you, who had these impulses to just come to you in prayer, to, to always be concerned with what your word says, to be concerned with obeying you first, uh, rather than fearing what people think or what people might do. We pray that you would make us like that. Help us cherish your word, learn your word, um, fear you more than we fear men. Help us love to do right. And um, we give you praise that it's only by your grace that we can be forgiven for all the times we don't do right. And we know we are not earning any of our salvation, but we're thankful for the grace that has brought us salvation for your grace. It's brought us salvation uh, so that we're free to live this way, free to, to work, free to please you uh, and love others. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.